the choir has just told us there's life, there's death in the tongue. Let's pray together that the Lord God today we make our tongues to speak life and not death. Let's pray that short prayer. God will make my tongue to speak life into my destiny and never to utter death sentence into my predestination. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Almighty Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I stand here this morning to give your people your word as thou shalt give it to me. I pray, O oh Lord God, that this message will come out right from your throne and be brought to us by the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray you grant me utterance and let there be definite work of transformation on every tongue in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that all weaknesses be taken away and every ear be attentive to your word in Jesus' name. We look up to you for transformations. We receive them right now. Thank you, Father, for answering our prayers. For in Jesus' mighty name we pray. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We come to this message titled, The Terrible Cost and Consequence of Tongues in Ministry. The terrible cost and consequence of tongues in ministry. Turn over your Bibles with me to James chapter 1. We look at verse 26. It's a very popular scripture. James chapter 1 verse 26. Then we'll move on to chapter 3 later on. Chapter 1 verse 26 of James says, if any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Chapter 3, verse 1 and verse 2. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all, if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. Here in these scripture passages are revealed to us a hidden fact about the chief determinant of our faith. The redemptive value of our religion depends on the content and cleanness of our communication. No matter the depth of our spiritual attainments, the height of our ministerial performances, and the exposure, experience, and giftings that we may have, if we conduct ourselves with a loose and white tongue, the end of our piety will be both calamitous and catastrophic. Our salvation loses its authenticity and our sanctification becomes mere perfunctory sanctimony. And our ministerial services are stripped of divine approval. If our state remains unchanged, we are heading for an awful, fearful, and painful eternal tragedy. If the state of our tongues remains unchanged and our tongues remain unbridled, we are heading for an awful fearful and painful eternal tragedy but I believe God that he will walk on our tongues and everything about us as ministers will improve for better in Jesus name James 3 verse 6 James chapter 3 verse 6 says and the tongue is the fire a word of iniquity so is the tongue among our members that it defiles the whole body and set it on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell if your tongue is set on fire of hell if your tongue goes to hell 
where will you go? The word tongue is scripture. Generally means language, words, verbal expressions, utterances, speech, or communicative acts. Therefore, when the Bible talks about the physical tongue that we have in our mouth, it's referring to words, to language, to expressions, to every communicative act that we make. It's not the trouble. The trouble is not with the tongue itself. As a member of the body, as a cardiac muscle in our mouth, it is not the tongue per se. It is a protective, the productive potential of the tongue itself. What the tongue is capable of doing, that's the problem. That's the danger. We are damned or delivered by the abuse or use of our tongue. Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, 24. When the Bible talks about the tongue, don't look at your physical tongue and attempt to mortify physically, to cut it off. It's referring to the usage of the tongue, the abusage of the tongue. Matthew chapter 12. Let's look at verse 34. Matthew 12, verse 34 says, O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Look at verse 35. A good man out of the good treasure of the, of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. Things, those are the problem in verse 26. But I say unto you that every idle word that a man shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. So when we talk about the tongue, we're referring to words, to language, to expression, to the uses we put our tongue to. The tongue has frighteningly potential. Frightening potential. The tongue has frightening bipolarity. As we see in James chapter 3, verse 9 to 12, the tongue is able to perform negatively and also positively depending on the user. Words are drivers of wars and anchors of peace, builders of home and wreckers of marriage. Weapons of persuasion and destroyers of compliance. Agents of motivation and chillers of enthusiasm. Catalysts of promotion and triggers of demotion. Words are facilitators of success and factors of failures. Words are shapers of destiny at the same time destroyers of future. They are vehicles of benedictions and at the same time vehicles of failures, of malediction, viruses of maledictions. Words are the preservers of purity and at the same time polluters of perfection. The mechanisms of salvation and the machineries of damnation and so on and so forth. That's why James wants us again in chapter 3 verse 10. James chapter 3 verse 10. That you should understand, you should recognize the bipolarity of your tongue and do something about it. James chapter 3 verse 10 says, Out of the same mouth proceed the blessing, think about that, and cursing. My brethren, complete it. These things ought not so to be. Say amen. The bipolarity of the tongue must is supposed to be brought under control. We should not allow our tongue to run wild. To do all it can do. To roam as it likes. We have to do what is called tongue check. We will do it in Jesus' name. Our communications can be pure. Our communication can help to perfect our holiness in the fear of God, it could help us to enhance our success in the work 
of the ministry. Our tongue, that's our speech or words, can be forward or faithful, can be lying or truthful. Our tongues can be scathing, harsh or gentle, depending on how we use it or how we control it. Our tongue can be proud or humble, can be instrument of blessing or vehicles of curses, can be flirtatious or frank, can be plain or perverse, can be corrupt or clean, can be confrontational or conciliatory, can be sharp, acidic, or soft, can be slanderous and scandalous or salted and sanctified. Therefore, we must do tongue checks, as I say, and practice graceful, refined speech, especially as preachers, teachers, and leaders. Otherwise, the cost and consequences of unchecked, untamed tongue and unrefined, graceless utterances for us will be terrible and tragic beyond human imagination. We will escape in Jesus' name. First Peter chapter 3, verse 10. First Peter chapter 3. Verse 10. Let's just quickly establish that fact. First Peter chapter 3, verse 10 says, For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. In verse 11, let him execute evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. Matthew chapter 12. Read the other time. Read it again. Verse 26, Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 and 37. Matthew 12, 36 and 37 says, But I say unto you that every idle word that man shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words Thou shalt be condemned. We will not be condemned in Jesus' name. Three points in this message. Number one, the characteristics and communicative competencies of the tongues of men. The characteristics and communicative competencies of the tongues of men. The characteristics and communicative competencies of the tongues of men. James again, chapter 3. Let's read from verse 3 to verse 12 or as far as we can go. James chapter 3, reading from verse 3 to verse 12. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listed. He will solve the tongue, is a little member, and boasted of great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a word of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and set it on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beasts and every birds and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It's an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeded blessings and cursing, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. But a fountain sent forth at the same place, sweet water and bitter. Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear holy berries, either a vine, figs, so can no fountain but yield salt water. And fresh. Who is a wise man and endure with knowledge among you? Let him shew out of good conversation his works with meekness 
of wisdom. Psalm 120, verse 3, verse 2, and verse 3. Psalm 120. We read two verses there. Verses 2 and 3. Psalm 120, verse 2 says, Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. This man had to pray this prayer by the Holy Spirit because he has learned in his own experience that the tongue cannot be tamed by natural human efforts. So he had to pray. He had to hand it over to God. We will pray this morning too and hand over our tongues to God for control. Say amen. amen. If we fail to do that, the cost and the consequences in ministry can be very tragic, very calamitous, and catastrophic. Here he prays that prayer, verse 3. What shall be given unto thee, O or what shall be done unto thee, thou false tongue? Sharp arrows of the mighty with coals of juniper. Our tongue, our mouth, is a vehicle of our words and communications. Who can talk when their tongue is missing? Nobody. The tongue, however, lends itself to both profitable use and deadly abuses. It is uncontrollable, naturally sinfully programmed to run wild and fire killer shots of fury and field. The adage, silence is golden, is probably born out of mass frustration by repeated failures to keep the tongue in check. The various types of tongues outlined in the scripture, we're going to see them just now, present us with the picture of extensive range of communicative competencies of the tongue and their positive or negative effects. So powerful is the tongue that its deployment in transmission of communications can alter the course of nature, detonate the course of events, and change the outlook of situations and content of decisions. Let's look at that in the scriptures. Negatives and positives. The list of negative tongues we can find in scripture include the following, not all of them. Number one, lying tongue. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 7. Lying tongue. I mean, that's very clear from that name. Lying tongue, the tongue that tells lies. I hope ministers are not, are not becoming liars. When they preach and they give testimonies or they try to illustrate their messages and we quote and give stories that are not substantiated or that we ourselves doubt their veracity. Lying tongue, Proverbs 6, 7, number 2. Striving tongue, striving tongue. Psalm 31, verse 20. Striving tongue, always fighting always pugnacious. They just want, when they speak, there will be war. When they speak, people are going to be provoked. Striving tongue, always in combat. Number three, blasphemous tongue. Blasphemous tongue, Psalm 73 verse 9. The tongues that of utter blasphemies against the Lord, against leadership, I pray no minister will have that kind of tongue here. Number four, flattery tongues. A flattering tongue. Proverbs chapter 6 verse 24, flattery. Calling people whom we know and what we know they are not. We just call them. We just make their heads to swear. We know this person. He's a poor man. And then he comes around and says, hey, welcome your excellency, your majesty. But it's a poor man. He has nothing close to that title at all. Not through the name. And how many women have been married by flatteries? They just flattered them and they got hooked by flatteries. 
And how many churches are ministry are built on flatteries today? And those who are members of those churches and ministries are on their way to hellfire. Flattery. Proverbs 6 verse 24. Number 5. Deceitful tongue. Deceitful tongue. I mean, that needs no explanation. That tongue is cooled in the art of deception. That is found in Romans chapter 3 verse 13. Deceitful tongue. Romans 3 13. Number 6. Scourging tongue. Scourging tongue. That's a tongue that knows how to beat without the, without the fist, without the whip, without the lashes. Some would say, I will tongue lash you. I tongue lash them. I, I, I use my tongue on them. You know, some will speak to you. They rebuke you fine. For, but if, for the next three or four days, you are feeling the the, the pepperish sensations all over your heart, your spirit, your soul, your body. Because you are so scorched by that kind of tongue. That's not the tongue of a preacher. We rebuke sharply. That's true. But we do not scorch with the tongue. We do not pepper with the tongue. That's what is happening here in Job chapter 5, verse 21. Scorching tongue. Number 6. Crafty tongue. Crafty. Some are very good in the art of manipulation. You cannot even tell whether they are speaking the truth or speaking the lie. Crafty and ironically, surprisingly, some Christians are so crafty when they speak with you. Job chapter 15 verse 5. Number 7. Sword. Tongue. Sword. Like a sword. The words that come from that kind of tongue pierces like, pierce, like, like uh, the sharp end of a sword. Psalm 64 verse 3. Piercing, scattering song, tongue, that's number 8. Piercing, very close to sword, tongue too. Piercing, scattering. Proverbs chapter 12 verse 18. Number 9. Forward, tongue, forward. Some tongues are forked. You know, a fork has more than one mouth or pointed edges. So when they speak to you, be careful, listen properly. They speak in language that divides into several bipolar senses. And you cannot tell exactly what sense is this person aiming at. That's why we call it forward tongue. Very deceitful. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 31. Forward. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 31. Number 9. Cursing. Cursing tongue. That needs to explanation. That's found in Romans chapter 1 verse 29. They curse a lot. Preachers. Cursing from the pulpit. Number 11. Number 10. Force tongue. Force. First tongue. Proverbs chapter 17 verse 4. 11. Naughty tongue. Naughty. Naughty. Proverbs chapter 17 verse 4. Naughty. Jesting. Never sober, never serious. Very light, very mischievous. Naughty. Naughty tongue. Proverbs 17 verse 4. The next time, proud tongue. Proud tongue. A tongue that's proud of uttering proud things, very boastful. And many, many times, those who are so boastful have nothing to back up their boastings. They boast anyway. And you can find preachers, you can find preachers who boast emptily. Not in the glory and the power of the Lord, but in their own personal abilities, which are deceptive. Proud tongues. The next one, flirtatious, mischievous tongues. Flirtatious, mischievous, vain tongues. The flatter. The mischievous, that's vain. Psalm 10, verse 17. The last of the negative tongue, tongue is backbiting tongue. Backbiting, slanderous tongue. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 23. Communications by these types of tongues damage relationship, trouble and defile Christ's body, defame and destroy ministry, 
and damn the soul in hell. Now, the positives. Say amen. Here, this is where we belong. This is our own target. This is our own desire. This is where sanctification will place us. The positive tongue in nature and effect. Number one, hold some tongue. Positive, hold some. Proverbs 15, hold some tongue. Verse 4. Proverbs 15 verse 4 says, A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. See, that's where we belong. But perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. Not only that, the next one, soft tongue, very soft. Soft tongue, Proverbs 25 verse 15. Many people think that to speak softly is an indication of weakness. No, sir, it's not. Soft tongue is indicative of sobriety and of sanctification. Soft. Proverbs 25, verse 15. By long forbearing is a prince persuaded, and a soft tongue breaketh the bone. The bone of rebellion, the bone of antagonism. The next one, wise and just tongue. Wise and just tongue, you see that in Psalm 37. Verse 30, Psalm 37, verse 30 says, The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom, and his tongue talketh of judgment. Next one is extolling praise tongue. Extolling praise tongue. The tongue that extols the wonderful glory, majesty, Compassion and love of the Lord God Almighty. Always praising the Lord. Give him glory all the time. Some can't say, they can't speak too long before they say praise the Lord. They are always praising the Lord. They are always appreciating the Lord on the pulpit, outside the pulpit. Never you hear them criticizing what the Lord is doing. Extolling praise tongue. Psalm 66 verse 17. Write it down. Psalm 126 verse 2. And then verse 3, Psalm 119, verse 172. I'm going to read that. 119, verse 172. 119, verse, verse 172 says, My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. The next one is learned or learned tongue. Learn it. The tongue of the learned. When they speak, such a tongue, when it speaks, you can perceive, you can get wisdom, deep thinking, revelations, insight, encouragement, strength, learn a tongue. It's not the tongue of the ignorant person who just, they just say anything. They just say anything, anything, just anything. And at the end of the day, you say, oh, what you have just said now is not true. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't even know. It's ignorant. It's not learned. It has nothing, no stuff, yet it speaks. That's it now. Learn a tongue, very learned. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4 says, The Lord God hath given me in the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. See that? He wakeneth morning by morning. He witnessed my here to hear us the learned. Next one, gracious tongue. Like the tongue of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. His tongue was gracious and is still gracious, not condemnatory at all. Luke chapter 4, verse 22. Luke chapter 4, verse 22 says here about gracious tongue. And all bear him witness. I wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? I pray the Lord God will give us gracious tongue in the name of Jesus Christ. Last but not the least, peacemaking tongue. The tongue of a peacemaker. This is the kind of tongue all of us should have. Because we are peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God. The minister that's always causing trouble, he would preach 
and the church will become empty. He will preach and his flock will flee. And he says, I'm preaching righteousness. You know, now you have a mentor. He preaching, he's preaching righteousness now for more than 40 years. And we are increasing. People are rushing to him. Why is your own sermon driving people away? Your sermon doesn't bring them in. Rather, it shoots them away. Why? Could it be that you lack peacemaking tongue? Judges chapter 8, verse 1 to 3. You hear the words of Gideon there when he had to pacify the people of Ephraim with a soft tongue. These are the types of tongues sanctified Christians and ministers have. And they are used to accomplish divine purposes in men's affairs. One fearful potential of our tongue, as I said before, is its capability to function for both negative and positive ends. Proverbs 18.21 The challenge about this, therefore, is our inability to restrict the tongue to positive, helpful, life-giving, life-saving, pure, perfect, remedial, reconstructive, reformative, and redemptive purposes only. Moreover, the tongue has the wide propensity to churn out words, the effect of which is contrary to the precepts, purpose, and plans of God. Therefore, a natural man is at the mercy of his own really evil tongue, evilly inclined tongue. But for ministers and Christian workers, the cost of such a tongue, the consequence of operating with such a wide, Romy, unruly, unholy tongue are too frightening to imagine. Point number two. The calamitous cost and consequence of the tongue in misuse. We are all Bible students and I don't have all the time to read all the scriptures. But look at this. Numbers chapter 13. Let's go for three. Numbers chapter 12. The calamitous cost and the consequence of the tongue in misuse. The calamitous cost and consequence of the tongue in what? Misuse. If you misuse your tongue, what's the cost as a minister, as a church worker? If you misuse your tongue and your tongue is not bridled at all, what's the consequence in ministry? Let's look at some examples. Numbers chapter 12 from verse 1. And Miriam and Aaron speak against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. Goodness me. The woman, it's, it was even an old woman now. This marriage took place how long, how long ago? Many, many years ago, Moses was close to 120 now. And these brother of Moses, Aaron and Miriam, who were together in his ministry, spoke against him. There was something behind that. Their grounds was not because of the marriage only. That's something I like to call subtractum influence. Something inside of them that they wanted to challenge Moses about. Envy was at the bottom of their utterance. The friend Moses was running the show and getting the praise all alone. And they thought that they too should have a share of the majesty of the prophet. Verse 2. And they said, Had the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses, had he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. You're speaking against the leadership, against God, against those you shouldn't have spoken against. They are not there. And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek above all men which were upon the face of the earth at that time. Yet they spoke against him. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam. Come out ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both came forth. And he said, hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision. 
and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so always faithful in all that house, in all my house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in the dark species. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them and completed. He departed. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle. And behold, what happened? Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. Well, I don't know how many of us now whose ministries have come under leprosy. Leprosy is a condition whereby all the membranes of the body will be falling off. And if you cannot hold the various parts of a ministry together, you're suffering from a leprosy condition. And we can trace the cause of this leprosy condition in your ministry to your abuse of your tongue. Miriam became leprous. What a calamitous cost and consequence of tongue in misuse. Numbers 13. Look at verse 1 to 3. Numbers 13, 1 to 3. The Lord spoke to Moses there to send to a spies to go spy out the land of Canaan. He gave them a brief. But these people came back and did more than the brief given to them. In verse 26. Numbers 13, 1 to 3, then I jump to 26 now. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran, to Kadesh, and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land with the thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey. This is the fruit of faith. Man, stop there. Verse 28, these people will not stop. That's their brief, but they went ahead. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw children of Anak there. Stop there, please. They will not. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Etites and the Jebusites, and the Hamorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. Stop there, please. You are going beyond your brief. They won't stop. Caleb tried to stop them. They will not. Verse 31. But the man that went up with him said, We will be not able to go up against the people. For they are stronger than we. That's not part of the brief. Misuse of tongue. They brought evil report. You know the story. If you read further down to our verse 26. Or up to the end of the chapter, verse 33. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which came, which come of the giants. And we were in our own side as grasshoppers. And so we were in their side. Chapter 14 now of Numbers. If you read from verse 1 to verse 10, look at the effect of their report. The whole camp of Israelites became frustrated, became frightened. And they decided, they, they, they began to, to murmur against Moses and against the Lord. They were even thinking of going back to Egypt. And when they tried to calm them down, Joshua and Caleb, they wanted to stone the people. So God appeared. Go further down to verse 37, 27 now of chapter 4. It says in verse 27, chapter 4, here, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation? which murmur against me. I've heard the murmurings of the children of Israel with the murmur against me. Say unto them, as truly as I live, said the Lord, as ye have spoken in my ears, complete it, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number from 20 years old and upward which have murmured against me. Doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein. Save who? Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and who? Joshua, the son of Nun. That's what happened here. Look at the cost. They lost Canaan. They lost the land of promise. Go down to verse 38. 
But Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of the men that went to search the land, lived still. You will live. Verse 37, go up there. Even those men that did bring the evil report upon the land, what did they do? Died by the plague before the Lord. And if you die in disobedience, if you die in blasphemy, if you die giving an evil report, if you die with the misuse of your tongue, any hope of heaven for those people? They went to hell. The Lord will deliver us in Jesus' name. Ah, say louder, amen. amen. If your tongue is not in check, forget about ministry. Nothing works again. Chapter 20, verse 1 to 12. Moses of all people. Numbers 20, verse 1 to 12. Fell into the trap of abuse of tongue. Think about that. Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into this desert of sin in the first month. And they put about in Kadesh. And Miriam died there and was buried there. Since our ministry came under leprosy, this was the next, this is the next time we're going to hear about him. His ministry just, just got frozen since that incident. And there was no water for the congregation and they gathered themselves against Moses and against Aaron, Aaron. And they began to speak as usual against God and against his servant. They, 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 those people were so prone to abuse of their tongues. And then Moses, verse 6, Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And they fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes. And it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So thou shalt give the congregation and their beast to drink. That's the instruction. Just speak to the rock. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Hear now ye rebels. No, oh, Moses, you are the meekest of all men on earth. Must we fetch you water out of this rock? Hey, if you allow members of your church to provoke you, to say things that the Lord does not approve, when the consequence and cost come upon you, they will not be able to help you out at all. God will say, you ought to know better. You are closer to me than these people. Because of that, look at verse 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, because you believed me not, God even charged them with unbelief. Think about that. To sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. You will not go there. They suffer the same fate like those other spies that brought the evil report. The only difference is Moses went to heaven. He made it. And we're reading his books today, and we are going to sing the song of Moses in eternity. Say amen. amen. Thank God he made it. Aaron made it. Thank God for them, for his mercy and grace. The tongue almost ruined their ministry. They lost Canaan. The Lord will have mercy on us in Jesus' name. Time will fill me. Write it down to read First Kings chapter 13. Verse 1 to 10. And verse 11. Verse 22. And verse 24. First Kings 13. Verse 1 to 10. Verse 11. Verse 22. To verse 24. The story of the prophet. The man of God from Judah. Some people call him young prophet. The Bible doesn't say so. He came down from Judah to Israel. And when he came down, he came to challenge the idolatrous practices of Jeroboam. He came with signs. He came with power. He came with divine authority. Raw power was demonstrated. But he came also with another divine instruction. Don't eat there. Don't drink there. 
and don't go back the same way lest anybody tries to bring you back. That instruction belonged to him, not part of the message. Say amen. amen. Another amen. amen. Don't preach beyond the syllabus. God Almighty gave him instruction. That's for own, his own personal security. But this is a leaky prophet. The man of God leaked so badly. Jerobram said, come and eat. He said, God had told me not to die. Not to drink, not to eat from this place, not to go by the way. That man, that's for you. No part of the message. Then the false prophet came to him and said, come and eat, come and drink, refresh yourself. He said, no, the Lord has told me this and this and that. Man, that's outside the syllabus. Then at the end of the day, he was to see that man say, all right, God told you by the word, angel of the Lord appeared to me by the word of the Lord. Come back to me, and he went back. You know the end of the story. Lion met him on the way. He was killed. For the first time, a lion stood beside its prey and did not eat it. God made him a public spectacle of divine correction for the misuse of tongue. I'm afraid. And the Lord God will help us because we see we trade with the tongue. We are in the business of speaking. Am I correct? That's what we do. We speak so, we utter so many words per day. More than the average man because we are preachers. And if any man offend not in words, the same is the person who is able to bridle the whole body. And the same is the person who is perfect. Mark chapter 8, verse 32 and verse 33, the story of Peter, rebuking the Lord Jesus Christ, saying, you will not die, you will not die. God forbid it. And Christ said, get thee behind me. What? Satan. Mark chapter 8, 32, 33. That's surprising. If you don't control your tongue, you become an instrument in the hands of Satan. You can be satanicized. Satan can say, they can satanize you. You can be satanized. You can be satanized. Because he's looking for somebody to lick. Somebody to, who has unbridled tongue with a leaky fellow. And he got Peter. A believer? But Peter, Peter could, could say anything. He's I mean, outgoing. Extrovert. As a minister, you may, you, may, you may be an extrovert. An extrovert. When you come to the ministry, you have to cut some extrovertness out and add some introversness. Be careful. Don't say, that's way I'm wired. That's way in our family, we're all talkers. Hey, you're in ministry now. You're not your, you're not your family. You won't go too far in ministry. You're going to come to a tragic end if you don't know how to bridle your tongue. Luke chapter 22 verse 31. Luke 22 verse 31. Luke 22 verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan had desired to have you that he may sift you as what? As wheat. He was looking for Peter. But he missed his target. Say amen. amen. Satan won't catch us. Whatever we need to put together. That's why we are here. I check my life, you check your life. Whatever we need to cut off, we go to Calvary. We pull out the tongue, put it on the altar, say, God, cut this down. Say amen. amen. And the Lord will cut it down in Jesus' name. Amen. If you go further down here in Acts chapter 5, verse 7 to 10, Acts chapter 5, verse 7 to 10, the story of Ananias and Sapphira. You may not see it. There's a lying tongue there, and they died the death for it. Malachi chapter 3, verse 13 to 16. Malachi chapter 3. I wish I had the time to develop all this. Malachi chapter 3. Look at the word of the Lord from verse 13 to 16. 
Your words have been stout against me, said the Lord. Yet he said, what have we spoken so much against thee? Ye have said, it's vain to serve God. Hear that, ministers. Have you not thought, our father told you this morning that Joseph was not saying, where is the dream now? Where is the fulfillment of all those dreams now? Everything has been destroyed and so on. That's what some ministers do. It is vain to serve God. We've been serving the Lord God since all these years. We've seen nothing happening to us. No positive things. I can pay my house rent. Can do this. Can do that. And the church itself is not growing. And all my mates are professors and doctors and engineers. And I'm here in this village. Talking to people who don't appreciate me. It's vain to serve the Lord. Don't say that. If I've said that, go back to Calvary and pray for forgiveness. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked more fully before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. Then they that fear the Lord speak of one to another. Did you hear what they are saying? Did you hear what the pastor is saying? Did you hear that? Ah, oh, how could I have talked like that? And the Lord hearkened, completed, and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him. For them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. Your works are written down in the book of remembrance. Reward will come. A payday is coming. The future, eternity, belongs to you and me in Jesus' name. Proverbs 31, Proverbs 31. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 10, sorry. Verse 31, Proverbs chapter 10. Verse 31. Proverbs 10, 31 says, The mouth of the just bringeth forth wisdom. But the fraud tongue completed shall be cut off. If your tongue is cut off, where will you be yourself? Chapter 17, verse 20. 17, verse 20. Calamitous cost and consequence of the tongue in misuse. Proverbs 17, verse 20 says, He that hath a fraud heart findeth no good. And in that hath a perverse tongue, fall it into what? Mischief. God will deliver us in Jesus' name. Chapter 26, verse 28. Proverbs 26, verse 28. A lying tongue etcheth those that are afflicted by it. And a flattering mouth worketh ruin. You see, the tongue destroys or blesses its owner. Think about that. So unreal, so unmerciful. Whatever you say comes back to you. If you bless, you are blessed. If you curse, complete it. We shall not be cursed. In the name of Jesus Christ. The calamitous cost and consequence of the tongue in misuse. Psalm 12 verse 3. Psalm 12, verse 3. Psalm 12, verse 3 says, The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips, and the tongue that speaketh what? Proud things. If the tongue is cut off, where will you be? Calamitous cost and consequence of the tongue in misuse. He will silence false preachers. He will make them to lose recognition and relevance and at the end of the day if they don't repent it will usher them into eternal hellfire ministers of the gospel are all who work in the Lord's sanctuary and they should watch their tongue and mind the language they should hold their tongue bound under God's grace by aligning its use with pure content of their heart and God's word ministers ruin their ministry suffered from loathsome disease like Miriam, earned the Lord's displeasure, died ignobly like the that prophet from Judah, and untimely. And some even were damned for eternal hell 
like those spies, because they failed to bring their tongue into subjection. Their provoked heart primed and prompted their tongue to do the following. Number one, to speak where they should have been silent. If your heart is provoked, hold on. If your heart is charged, hold on. Don't speak that time, please. There are many things you don't have to comment on everything you see or everything happened in the church. What do you have to judge? All things that they don't even concern you at all. Not even part of your ministry. Speak where they should have been silent. That's what they did. Number two. Speak. They spoke. So speak without refining their thoughts. Their thoughts came. Whatever kind of thoughts they have. They simply gave vent to them. They spoke without refining their thoughts. Number three. They revealed what the Lord wanted them to conceal. Say amen. Like that young prophet we call him. Revealing what the Lord wants you to conceal. Seal it up. That's for you. Own it. That's for your safety. That's not part of the preaching syllabus. Number four. They echoed Satan's agenda. Like those spies, what the devil is looking for somebody to help project, they echo that. Number five, they lied against the truth. Number six, they are extravagant with the use of words. Go and be stingy with your tongue. Say amen. I'm generous with your money. Go ahead. I'm generous with love. Go ahead. I'm generous with speech. Uh -uh. No. Be economical with the use of words. Those who were not paid for it. Point number three. The cure, cleansing, and control of our tongue as ministers. The cure or the care Cleansing and control of our tongue as ministers. My time is slipping away quickly now. Psalm 50 verse 19. Psalm 50 verse 19. Verse 19 says, Thou givest thy mouth to evil and thy tongue frameth deceit. Look at that. Don't give your tongue that. Psalm 51 verse 14. Verse 14 says, Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation. I and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. Give your tongue to that. Speaking righteousness. That's tongue care. The care, the cleansing. Psalm 52, verse 2. 52, verse 2. Verse 2 says, The tongue deviseth mischiefs like a sharp razor, working deceitfully. Don't give your tongue to that. Psalm 120. Verse 2 and verse 3, 120. Verse 2 and verse 3. In my distress, I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me. Verse 3, verse 2, verse 2. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips. Say amen. That's prayer. And from a deceitful tongue. Pray that prayer today, and God will answer us in Jesus' name. Hand it over to God for, ke- for cleansing. Hand it over to God for controlling mechanism. 141 verse 3. Psalm 141 verse 3. Verse 3. Psalm 141 verse 3 says here. Set a watch. O Lord. This is Psalm of David. Before my mouth. Say that prayer. Say after me. Set a watch. O Lord. Before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. And the church would say, Amen. Very important. That's what we should do. But then, we pray about it. We hand it over to God. But we have our own part to play. Joshua chapter 6 verse 10. Write it down. Verse 16 and verse 20. John chapter 4 verse 7. 
John chapter 4, verse 7. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Chapter 5, verse 8 of First Peter. Acts chapter 20, verse 14. And First Peter chapter 3, verse 10. First Peter chapter 3, verse 10. Proverbs 10, 19. Proverbs 10, 19. I like to read that. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19. Verse 19 says, In the multitude of words completed, there wanted not sin, but he that refraineth his lips, finish it up, is wise, be economical with speech. Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. Colossians chapter 4, look at verse 6. I need to read this also. Colossians chapter 4, verse 6 says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Grace, salt. Check your words. Put grace, put salt. And then utter your words. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. It says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. It's about to come. Stop it. But that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. We will do it in Jesus' name. We have that responsibility. Psalm 39 verse 1. David do pray the prayer. Look at what it says here in Psalm 39 verse 1. As we try to run off. Psalm 39 verse 1. I said, I will take heed to my ways that I see not with my tongue. You see, after praying that prayer, I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked complete it is before me the tongue can no man tame but god can help us tame it by prayer also we can help the situation and put our tongue under control into subjection by practice seven things you have to do number one resort to silence in the absence of facts resort to silence in the absence of what? Facts. If you have no facts, don't speak. Number two, remain sober in the fight of faith. Sobriety. All these are references. Remain sober in the fight of faith. Peter, First Peter chapter 5 verse 8. Number three, regular submission to the will of the Father. Regular submission to the will of the Father. Acts chapter 20 verse 14. Acts 20 14. Regular submission to the will of the Father. Number four. Refrain from sour tales and falsehood. Refrain from sour tales and falsehood. First Peter chapter 3 verse 10. Refrain from sour tales and falsehood. Chapter 3 verse 10 of First Peter. Number five. Reduce your words. To a few. Say amen. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 19. Reduce your words to a few. Number six. Refine your speech. With the faith. The totality of the doctrines of the word of God. Refine your speech with the faith. Not the faith general saints. The totality of the word of God. Refine your speech with that. Colossians chapter 4 verse 6. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29. Colossians 4 6. Ephesians 4 29. Refine your speech with the faith. Number 7. Resist the urge to speak with flatteries. Resist the urge to speak with flattery. Psalm 39 verse 1. Psalm 50 verse 19. Resist the urge to speak with flatteries. Psalm 39 verse 1. Psalm 50 
verse 19. No time for me to develop all this. But I pray to the Lord God for me and for you, for you and for me, that the Lord God will work on our mouths, work on our tongues, and as ministers, the sanctification of our heart is a necessity for a tongue under control. And when you have that sanctification, use it. Don't have a car, you refuse to ride it. Remember you are sanctified already, you got the express, you got the evidences. And when you are tempted to speak unadvisedly, use sanctification to correct it. Say amen. amen. We rise up to pray. And tell the Lord God in the name of Jesus Christ, I bring my tongue and all the repertoire of my speech to your presence today. And I pray, O oh Lord God, that to sanctify my heart and sanctify my tongue and set a watch over my lips and close the door of my mouth. I leak so badly, Lord. Shut the door of my mouth. Be the gatekeeper for my tongue and for my speech and my communication. I need the grace to keep quiet. I need the grace to be silent when I don't have the facts at all. I need the grace to speak the right word in the right season. I need the grace that my speech will be salted. And no corrupt communication will come out of my mouth at any time. I need the grace to be grave, to be heavy in my speech, in my comportment. And when I'm happy, when I'm rejoicing, I need the grace to keep moderation and to watch the use of my tongue, the behavior of my tongue. If we pray and we take caution, the Lord God Almighty will help us. We are ministers. We can't afford, afford, we can't afford to be flippant with the use of our tongue. Our tongue should be sacred. Our speech holy. Few but heavy. Correct. Pray. You are singers. Your mouths, your tongues are sanctified to sing us glory and sing his praises. Don't let corrupt communication come from that mouth. It's sanctified already. And it's for holy use. No corruption. No defilement. No evil. No gossiping. Backbiting slander. Should proceed from our mouth. It may want to come. Shut it down. Get hold of the weapon of sanctification. Which you have. And shut it down. Slander is about coming. You're about to criticize. You're about to curse. You're about to say things you shouldn't have said. Remember, take hold of the weapon of sanctification and shut it and cut it down. The Lord will help me. The Lord will help you. Our tongues will be sanctified. Our speech will be holy. Our communications will be righteous. We're not going to be criticizing leadership in the church. Decisions of leadership. Administrative decision. You know, you were not there when the Lord told the pastor to do it. And now you come around, you want, you want to analyze everything and pass comment and pass judgment. That's not your brief. That's not your assignment. Don't preach outside the syllabus. Let's not reveal what we're supposed to conceal. What the Lord has given to you for your own personal edification, security. It's not for everyone to hear that. Speech control. Give me, O oh Lord, the capacity.